أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah one, uh, verse 106 of Surah At-Tawbah and others are made to await the command of God either he will punish them or he will pardon them and God is knowing and wise this particular verse refers to a group of individuals who remained in Medina and did not join the Holy Prophet on his military expedition to Tabuk. Now, as we mentioned in the previous verses, there were individuals who did not join the Prophet, but shortly after the Prophet returned, they expressed great remorse. Individuals like Abu Lubaba, as we mentioned in our previous session, they felt so regretful and so embarrassed and so humiliated and ashamed of what they had done that they they tied themselves to the pillars of the masjid and begged the Holy Prophet for forgiveness and begged God for forgiveness. And then you have, of course, the, the staunch hypocrites who were elated over the idea of not having to join the Prophet, who showed absolutely no remorse, who in fact were rejoiced at the fact that they found a way that they were able to evade that uh, that responsibility and then you have a third category who were neither ardently repentant like abu lababa and and his companions and nor were they indifferent as the hypocrites so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions abu lababa and those companions who stayed behind but were repentant in verses 102 and 103 as we mentioned last week and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he speaks to us about those hypocrites who showed no remorse who were glad to stay behind and Allah mentioned them in verses 94 and 96 however there's a third group so there are the the repentant ones those who showed remorse and there are those who are totally indifferent. And then you have this third category of companions who stayed behind, who were, who were not necessarily bad people, but they did indeed commit a major sin by failing to join the Prophet. Now, commentators identified these companions as, as the following. So the, this, this ayah is in reference to three particular companions. The first is Hilal ibn Umayyah, the second is Marara ibn Rabi'ah, and the third is Ka'ab ibn Malik. So these three companions, they stayed behind, they did not join the Prophet in Tabuk, and they did not express repentance. They did not repent, they were not ardent, ardently repentant as Abu Lubaba was and others, nor were they indifferent. So when the Prophet returned, they didn't immediately seek pardon when the Prophet arrived in Medina, nor did they bind themselves to the pillars. When the Prophet returned, the Muslim community was commanded to shun them, neither to keep neither keeping company with them. And even historians note that even their wives, the Prophet had asked their wives to separate from them, that they were to return to their families. And then, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, later on in this surah, in, in verse 117 and 118, there is the official pardon that is given to them. So this verse essentially is speaking about people, how to judge people who are neither evil and who are neither good. You know, and, so, and many times we we encounter people who who are not pious, but also they're not they're not evil. They're somewhere in the middle, and that's why you know people often ask, you know, what's going to happen? You know, especially you know converts they ask this question that okay, I converted to Islam, I was able to recognize the truth. What's going to happen to my parents? You know, what's going to happen to to so and so who seems like a decent person, but you know, has committed certain sins and so on and so forth. 
So this verse is really, I would argue, should be our answer to the question of where is this person going to go in the hereafter? What is the position of this person in the eyes of God? So as I've mentioned, this group did repent, but they did not repent in a way that was suitable and befitting for the sin that they committed. You know, it's, it's almost as like someone committing murder and they just say, oh, sorry, sorry about that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to understand the gravity of the sin that they committed, that they abandoned the messenger. They failed to support the prophet. So it's not enough for them just to say that, oh, we're sorry. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says that their, their judgment is with God. And this, as I said, should be our answer to any any time to any question where we're asked directly about what is the the future of an individual where will they be in the hereafter so the answer is that we leave it to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fact the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa ali, he actually condemns people he rebukes people who make absolute judgments about the akhirah of, of people. So there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he says, min ummati, That woe be upon those who speak about the future, who foreshadow what is to happen to people. Meaning individuals, and the Prophet then explains, who are Al-Muta'alleen. Al-Muta'alleen, those who speak, the predictors, as the Prophet calls them. Al-Ladheena yaquluna fulanun fil jannah wa fulanun fil nar. The Prophet rebukes people who speak in absolute terms, who conclusively say that this person is in jannah or this person is in the hellfire. Unless God has revealed, unless the infallibles have disclosed that information to us, we cannot make um, an unequivocal statement about the hereafter of any individual. And this is why when, uh, when Sa'ad bin Ma'ad, Sa'ad bin Ma'ad was one of the famous companions of the Prophet who, who fought alongside the Prophet in many battles, he was very well respected in the Muslim community. When he died, the Holy Prophet attended his funeral. The Prophet prayed over him. The Prophet went down into his grave and he buried him with his own hands. The narrations say that Sa'd bin Ma'ad's mother was in attendance. She, she attended the funeral of her son. And when she saw that the Prophet took it upon himself to participate in the funeral procession that the prophet prayed over him he went down into the grave and he buried him she says she addresses her deceased son and she says ya sa'ad hani lak al jannah oh sa'ad how fortunate are you that that you know i offer you the glad tidings that you will be among the people of jannah the Prophet interjects. He says, Ya Umm Sa'd, la tajzimi ala rabbiki. He says to her that, O oh, the mother of Sa'd, do not speak on behalf of God. Inshallah, your son will enter paradise, but don't speak definitely about people because we don't know what's in people's hearts. So Allah says, وَآخَرُونَ مُرْجَوْنَ لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ And others are made to await the command of God, the judgment of God. إِمَّا يُعَذِّبُهُمْ God may punish them, وَإِمَّا God may punish them, وَإِمَّا يَتُوبُ عَلِيمٌ And He may pardon them. Now the reason why Allah doesn't give a definite answer is because Allah doesn't want us to become overly confident in His mercy whereby we start to act irresponsibly we start to sin indiscriminately because oh god is the most merciful nor does allah want us to lose hope allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instilling this balance in us the balance of hope and fear 
So the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a bit more strict with this group. Now the munafiqeen, Allah condemns them. He threatens them with hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the tawbah of the likes of Abu Lubaba, who ardently repented, who showed public remorse for their sin. You know, because failing to assist the Prophet is a public sin, and therefore they felt that it would be suitable for them to make toba publicly and to ex and to display remorse and regret in a public setting. So Allah offers them His pardon a bit quicker. Now, because this group of individuals, the three individuals that I mentioned, because they did not quickly seek repentance, they did not quickly seek forgiveness. Allah speaks to them in a more stern tone. And this is why it's important for us, brothers and sisters, that when we commit sins, we don't delay tawbah like these individuals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught them a lesson. You know, the Prophet shunned them. Their wives were separated from them. This was done to do what? To teach people that when you commit a sin, don't delay tawbah. Do not belittle these iniquities. Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says, in qarafta sayyi'atan fa'ajjil mahwaha bit-tawbah. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says that when you perpetuate a sin, when you commit a sin, hasten to erase it through repentance. Why does the Imam say hasten to erase it? Because the reality is we don't know when death is going to come to us. We don't know when we're going to die. Delaying death, delaying toba, is tantamount to saying that I have, I, I definitely have more time. So it, it conveys a type of, of arrogance, a type of certainty about the length of your life, whereby you have no guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the virtue of, of hastening towards Forgiveness when you commit a sin is, is highlighted in this verse. And also that we shouldn't judge people. You know, sometimes you might see someone, they seem evil, but don't say that this person is from Ahl al-Nah, that this person is from the, the, the people of the hellfire. And if you see someone do good, don't say, oh, this person is definitely among the people of paradise. Leave it to leave judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah's God has revealed that this person is from the people of paradise, or the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have given us an indication that this person is among the inhabitants of paradise, we should reserve judgment. Verse number 107, وَالَّذِينَ and as for those who established a mosque for harm and disbelief and to divide the believers and to be an outpost for those who made war on God and his messenger before, they will surely swear, we desire what is best, but God bears witness that truly they are liars. This ayah, this verse, describes a mosque that was built during the time of the Prophet. A mosque that was built by a group led by a man named Abu Amr al-Rahib. Abu Amr al-Rahib was a monk. Before the Prophet ﷺ arrived in Medina, before the Prophet migrated to Medina, Abu Amr was one of the most prominent individuals in Medina, which was known at the time as Yathrib. And he belonged to a prominent tribe, the tribe of Al Aus. You know, so Medina is comprised of these two major tribes, Al Aus and Al Khazraj. So this man by the name of Abu Amr, he converts to Christianity before the Prophet arrives. He becomes an expert on on Christian scripture, he becomes a monk, and therefore he was a person of, he was a very popular personality. He was a very prominent and a very notable individual in, in Yathrib society. So when the Prophet arrives, 
of course, what happens? People start to surround the Prophet. Attention shifts from Abu Amr al-Rahib to Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And after the battle of, of Badr, when Abu Amr al-Rahib saw that the Muslims were victorious, that the Prophet and his followers were victorious in, in Badr, when he saw the resilience of the Prophet and his movement, he became jealous. So he, 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 he thought that, you know, we're just going to give safe haven to these poor, you know, downtrodden Muslims. And, you know, they're not going to really, you know, increase their influence. But when he saw that the Prophet won the Battle of Badr, he became jealous. And he became so envious that he was losing prominence in Yathrib that he, he actually lends support to Quraysh. Yeah. When he hears that Abu Sufyan and other leaders of Quraysh are marching towards Medina to seek revenge for what happened in the Battle of Badr, which, which becomes the Battle of Uhud, Abu Amr al-Rahib, he supports Quraysh. In fact, he lent them so much support that he actually was, he actually started to, he started to dig trenches on the battlefield in the Battle of Uhud, and the Prophet actually falls into one of these trenches and becomes uh, injured and actually breaks his front teeth. So after the Battle of uh, of Uhud, Abu Amr is you know he meets he can he encounters the Prophet. The Prophet invites him. He invites him to Islam, but he still refuses. So this man had a great amount of jealousy towards the Prophet. So, so after refusing to convert to Islam, some there are some indications that you know later on he he pretended to be Muslim. In any case, he his animosity for the Prophet continues to grow. And he actually travels to Rome. So Abu Amr al-Rahib, he travels to Rome and he actually meets the emperor of Rome. What does he want from the emperor of Rome? He's, he meets with the emperor of Rome to enlist his help against the Prophet. He wants help from Rome. He wants resources to help expel the Prophet from Medina. So after he secures some assistance from the Roman Emperor, he, uh, he delivers a message to his aides in, uh, in Medina, and he instructs them to build a mosque. He instructs them to build a mosque which would serve as an outpost for for the prophet's enemies for, so it, it was it was essentially an underground movement now when this mosque was being built of course you know naturally people started to ask questions you know why are you guys building this mosque so these are you know under these are muslims you know these are you know undercover enemies who are pretending to be Muslims, who are building a mosque, you know, and people can be very naive, you know, what's better than building a mosque? And they build the masjid on the outskirts of Medina. And the reason why they build this mosque, according to them, they claim that we're building this mosque, and they build it very close to Masjid Quba. Masjid Quba was the masjid that was built you know, when the Prophet came on his hijrah, when he arrived in Medina, he doesn't enter Medina right away. He waits for Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, to join him and they enter Medina together. So the Prophet is stationed in this area and they end up building a mosque there, Masjid Quba. For those of you who've been to Medina, you've seen it. It was the first mosque that was built in the, in the history of Islam, Masjid Quba. So this mosque was built closely to Masjid Quba. And when they were asked why they were building this mosque, they said that we're building it for the weak and the elderly who are not able to reach the city. That there are people that might not be able to, 
to offer their prayers in the mosque of the Prophet. So we built this mosque to, to allow for people to worship who don't have access and who don't have the means to offer prayers and attend the sessions and the programs at the, the Masjid of the Prophet. And they actually take it a step further. As the Prophet is preparing to leave for Tabuk, they approach the Prophet and they, they ask the Prophet to offer salah, offer jama'a prayers, congregational prayers in this masjid. Now, why do they do this? They say, oh, we want it for tabarruk. We want you to bless our center, our masjid. But the reason why they wanted the Prophet to pray there was to basically gain legitimacy. So when they extend this offer to this invitation to the Prophet to pray inside the masjid, the Prophet, of course, being the kind-hearted person that he was, he says that I'm, I'm busy at the moment. I have to go towards Tabuk, but inshallah, perhaps I will when I return. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals, you know, when the Prophet returns from Tabuk, he reveals this verse and he basically discloses the motives and the intentions behind the building of this mosque. Now, when you when you look at this verse, there is there are implicit descriptions of what a masjid is supposed to be. You know, when we want to assess the the value of a masjid. And inshallah, I'll, I'll speak more about this in the next verse. What makes a masjid successful? What makes it effective? So the role of the masjid is, is highlighted in this verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes a mosque that was built for the sake of harming. That, and that's the meaning of the word dirar, to harm. He criticizes this mosque for propagating kufr for propagating values that are antithetical to Islam. And number three, that this is a mosque that is built to cause disunity. And it's a safe haven for the enemies of God and the Prophet. Therefore, you find that conversely, the role of a masjid should be what? To benefit people. If the, if the masjid is not offering any value, any benefit to people, that's not a true masjid. A masjid should propagate Islamic values. The masjid should not be treated as a country club where we promote cultural values and that trump Islamic values. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا ضِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا a masjid, the role of the masjid is to propagate and disseminate Islamic teachings, Islamic values. The role of a masjid is to do what? It's not to disunite people. It's to unite people, to bring the hearts together. And that's why in even in the Shia community, I see this as a big problem. You know, many times you go to a masjid and... You see, it's it's very well known that this masjid is is welcomes people who do the taqlid of this specific marja. Many of the masajid have become centers where we promote certain maraja at the expense of alienating other believers. And it's done in a way that causes division in the community. The Quran here highlights that. The role of the masjid is to bring people together, to unite the hearts. The role of a masjid is not to become a camp for one specific group, a camp that propagates only one specific jurisprudential view and makes others feel alienated. The, mas the masjid needs to be a place of unity. And the masjid should not be a safe haven for the enemies of God. We should not w welcome individuals who are hostile towards the Muslim community, individuals 
you know, like Madeleine Albright, like, you know, George W. Bush, like others. You shouldn't open your doors to individuals like this. Don't make your masjid an outpost for people who are known for committing crimes against humanity, against the Muslims. That the masjid is not a safe haven for the enemies of God. And Allah says, in aradna illa husna." These people that had have, have, have nefarious intentions, they're not going to reveal to you their nefarious intentions. They're gonna they're gonna sound like well wishers. They're gonna appeal to your religious sentiment. Oh, we're building this masjid to help the poor, to to make it more accept to make worship more accessible to the elderly. And individuals who might have, you know, some limitations. They use, they appeal to the religious sentiments. But Allah bears witness that they're liars. And we have a modern day example of this. A modern day example of this is Saudi Arabia, for example. Saudi Arabia is committing the greatest you know, the greatest humanitarian crisis is being perpetuated by the Saudis in Yemen. They're committing their crimes. But why are they still so respected around the world? Because they claim to do good. They say, oh, we're building masajid in all corners of the world. We're handing out free copies of the Quran. We are what? Khadimul Haramain. You know, they. They create this, this beautiful veneer to distract you from the crimes that they're committing. You know, the, the, the king of Saudi Arabia, he calls himself what? He's, he's, a, he's an enemy of humanity, but he calls himself what? The custodian of the true sacred mosques. So again, when they speak, they'll appeal to your religious sentiment. And that is done to, to hide their crimes or to distract you from the crimes they commit. So when this message is built, an, ex an invitation is extended to the Prophet. In ayah number 108, Allah very clearly tells the Prophet, do not step foot in that masjid. لا تقم فيه أبدا لمسجد أسس على التقوى من أول يوم أحق أن تقوم فيه فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا والله يحب المطهرين. Allah says to the Prophet, never stand in it. Truly a mosque founded upon piety from the first day is worthier of you standing in it. In it are men who love to purify themselves and God loves those who purify themselves. How do you judge the value of a masjid? How do you determine that this is a good masjid and this is not something that qualifies to be called as a house of worship? You know, the way that we judge a masjid, we have a very superficial standard of what it means to be a beautiful masjid. We judge the value of a mosque based on its architecture that you know is is the dome made out of gold what type of carpets you know how many members does this masjid have how many programs do they hold how 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 many square feet is this masjid we have a very superficial way of gauging the value of a masjid here allah gives us two Two ways. There are two things that define a masjid, that give value to a masjid. There are two things that we should look for when we want to assess the efficacy of a masjid, the efficiency of a masjid, the value of a masjid. Number one, Allah says, La masjidun usisa ala taqwa min awwaliyam. That a mosque that has value, that is beloved in the eyes of God, and this applies to not just mosques, to any center, to any project, any initiative, 
any mosque that is based on piety. Meaning what? What gives a masjid value is the intention behind building that masjid. The intention behind the construction of this masjid is the single most important factor in success. And that applies to all of your work, all of your projects. If something is done purely for the sake of Allah, it will continue to grow even after your death. But if something is not done for the sake of Allah, you will see it crumble even in your lifetime. It's not going to have any barakah. It's not going to yield the fruits that you want. So at the intention, whenever we do anything, if we want it to flourish, if we want it to be pleasing to Allah, we have to have the right intentions. You know, sometimes we focus so much on the work that we, have, we forget about the intention behind the work. So Allah says that a mosque that is built on taqwa, that is built with the right niyyah, that's what determines the value of a masjid. And a mosque like the mosque of Quba was built with pure intentions. And that's why even today, if you go to Medina, Masjid Quba is still there. It still stands. It remains standing because it was built on a strong foundation. It was built for the sake of God. And things that are done for the sake of God, they endure. They last. So this is the first, this is the first indicator that a mosque has true value. The second thing that we need to pay attention to is that what makes the masjid beautiful is fihi rijalun yuhibbuna ayyatatahru. What makes, makes a masjid beautiful, it's not the architecture, it's not the chandeliers, it's not how many people go. It's the quality of the people that, that attend that masjid. It's the people that make the masjid beautiful. And not any people. Allah says people who, are, who love to purify themselves. So what makes a masjid valuable in the eyes of God is a masjid that is built with pure intentions, and a masjid that is attended, the attitude of those who attend that masjid, meaning they come to the masjid not to just socialize and, and backbite and gossip. They come to the masjid because their primary motivation is to purify their souls. They love to improve themselves. They love to engage in tazkiyah to nafs. So the intention behind the construction of a masjid and the quality of the attendees determines the beauty of a masjid. And therefore you might find a $20 million masjid. It looks beautiful, but in the eyes of God, it is hideous because it wasn't built for his sake. And the people that attend this masjid are not interested in purifying their souls. They're interested in eating, in gossiping. They're not interested in in to nafs, in improving themselves. And then you might have a masjid that's 500 square feet. It's in a remote area, and only a handful of people attend and pray in this masjid. But those handful of people, you know, this place was built for the sake of God, and it's attended by people who are interested, who love to seek nearness to God. This is what makes a masjid beautiful and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 109 afaman so is one who founded his building upon reverence for God and his pleasure better or one who founded his building on the brink of a crumbling bank 
which then crumbles with him into the fire of hell, and God does not guide the wrongdoers. Here again, Allah is, is reiterating this idea that you don't know how to judge. You don't know how to judge. You only see the vahir, the what is you see the outward appearance of things. During the time of the Prophet, if we were to see this mosque that we was being built by Abu Amr al Rahib, we would have said, What's this is a masjid and Quba is a masjid? What's the difference? Allah says, You're naive. You don't know how to judge. What's better, a mosque that is built? For the sake of God to seek his pleasure or a mosque that is built on the bank on the on the on the that is a building on the brink of crumbling on a bank so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this imagery you would never build a mosque on a crumbling bank you would never do that but Allah here is revealing to us that when you do things with the wrong intentions, if you do something for other than Allah, it is inherently weak. This verse is highlighting the inherent weakness of anything that is not connected to God. It may look impressive. It may look like a fortress. But if it is not done for the sake of the living who does not die, it will inevitably perish. So those who have insight, they understand that doing something without the proper intention, it's like building something on a crumbling bank. And it will crumble with you into the the fryer of hell. And God does not guide the wrongdoers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, one of the ways to deprive yourself of Allah's guidance is to be a valim, to oppress, to wrong. And the the intention behind, the aim behind building that masjid by Abu Amr was to cause harm to others. If you live a life where you're constantly inflicting harm on others, you will never receive divine guidance. This is why Allah says, Wallahu la al Every day we ask Allah, Guide us to the straight path. When you read the Quran, pay attention to those statements, to those verses where Allah says, and God does not guide. And then there's a blank. Whatever that blank is filled with, do not be that person. Do not be a vadim. Do not be a fasid. Because people who wrong others, who oppress others, they are deprived of the greatest thing, which is what? Divine guidance. You're depriving yourself of Allah's hidayah. Verse number 110. لا يزال بنيان بنيانهم الذي بنوا ريبة في قلوبهم إلا أن تقطع قلوبهم والله عليم حكيم. The building they built, which is a reference to that mosque that they wanted to build, the building they built, Masjid Dharar, will not cease to be a disquiet in their hearts, a disturbance in their hearts, till their hearts are rent asunder and God is knowing and wise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, it's a very beautiful verse. He's speaking about this idea of internal disturbance when you do something evil. You know, in this life, when you do good, the first reward that Allah gives you when you do good is that He makes you feel at peace. You feel tranquility. You feel this serenity, this sense of pleasure. That's why, you know, people, you know, if you're depressed, you know, psychologists and, and counselors, they recommend that you volunteer, that you do things, that you that you engage in 
in volunteer work, in charitable work, because it makes you feel good. And this is one of this is this is a divine gift that when you do good, you feel good about it. You know, people who who give charity, who help others, they actually live longer and, and happier lives. So the first reward that is given to the good doer is actually experienced in this life. It's that sense of peace, that sense of tranquility that you feel. And also on the flip side, when you do something evil, when you hurt people, when you commit sin, no amount of wealth or fame can mask the disturbance that you feel in your heart. Now these oppressors, these individuals who have wealth, who have fame, who have everything, but they commit crimes. Do you think that they sleep well at night? That they, they're always living in this state of agitation. This is, this is the sunnah of Allah. This is the fitrah. That Allah has designed our hearts and our souls in such a way that when you do good, your heart feels at rest. And when you do evil, when you commit crimes, when you commit sin, when you commit wrong, when you commit evil, you feel this uneasiness. And Allah says that these individuals who built this masjid, and by, and by the way, the Prophet, when he returns, he commands the Muslims to burn it. They actually destroyed Masjid, Masjid Dirar. So even after it was destroyed, Allah says that these individuals, Abu Amr al-Rahib and his allies, they always felt this uneasiness in their hearts. Because they did wrong, because they committed evil and they did not repent, they, the first punishment that is given to them is that they never feel this inner peace. They're always agitated. There's, there's an internal disturbance, a, a continuous internal disturbance that they feel. Now, after speaking about the final abode of the disbelievers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, in the next verse, ayah number 111, He speaks about paradise and specifically the price for paradise. Allah says in verse 111, إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله فيقتلون ويقتلون وعدا عليه حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بعهده من الله واستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به Allah says, truly God purchased from the believers their souls and their wealth in exchange for the garden, for Jannah, for Jannah being theirs. They fight in the way of God, slaying and being slain. It is a promise binding upon him in the Torah, in the Gospel, and the Quran. And who is truer to his promise than God? So rejoice in the bargain you have made. Indeed, this is the great triumph. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse speaks about the price for paradise. Now, the commentators of the Qur'an, they observe a subtlety, a beautiful subtlety in this profound transaction between God and the believers. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse, He's speaking about His eagerness to give the believers paradise in exchange for what? For their souls and their wealth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is presenting himself as the buyer. 
Now, you don't buy anything unless it has value. You're not going to spend, you're not going to buy something. You only buy something that has intrinsic value or at least perceived value. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the heavens and the earth. You know, this is really a gesture of kindness on Allah's behalf because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents himself as the buyer, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also the seller because he, he owns the souls of the believers and he owns their wealth. So in this profound transaction, Allah is both the buyer and the seller. And it's similar to the way that parents would transact the affairs of their helpless infants. You know, imagine you have a child and you, you buy them something. You know, everything that you, you gave them, you own it. You bought it with your own money. But to, to show them kindness, to give them something greater than what they have, you pretend to buy it from them. You conduct a transaction. Now, even though you as the parent, you own, you own everything that the child has. You bought it for them. But to, to show your kindness to this helpless child, you kind of engage in this in this transaction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the same. Even though he owns the souls of the believers, even though he owns their wealth, he says that I, I wanna I wanna buy something from you. That are you willing to sell your soul? Are you willing to sell your wealth to me? And it belongs to him to begin with in exchange for eternal happiness, for paradise. Now, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of the heavens and the earth, to Allah belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Allah owns everything. The only time where Allah expresses a willingness to buy something is with respect to the souls of the believers. So out of everything that exists in the universe, in the world of creation, there is only one thing that Allah says, it is so dear to me, and it has so much value in my eyes that me, the Lord of the worlds, wants to buy it. Not the angels, not the heavens, not the earth. The one thing that Allah has his eye on, that has particular value in his eyes, are the souls, the nafs of the believer. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the hadith Qudsi, he says, لا يسعني أرضي ولا سماي, That I am not contained. Nothing has the capacity to contain me. I am not contained by the heavens nor the earth. The only thing that can contain me, that can hold me, is the heart of a believer. The only thing that, that uh, contains me is the heart of a believer. And therefore you find in this verse, Allah says, he wants to purchase the souls of the believers and their wealth. So anything that's connected to a mu'min has value. Allah says, I want it all. In exchange for something that is even greater, which is paradise. They, they fight in the way of God. And Allah then, he says, I don't care about the outcome. Whether you, whether you kill or are killed. Whether you are victorious in the battle or you fall as a martyr. Allah says, I don't care about the outcome. I care about the niyyah. I care about the state of your heart. If you do it for me, Jannah is yours. Whether you are killed or you kill. In, 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 the, in these defensive battles. The outcome doesn't matter. The niyyah matters. That it's fi sabilillah. Wa'dan alayhi haqqan. That this is a promise. You know when you 
when you conduct a transaction, say that, that you're the seller and someone wants to buy something from you and they buy it and they say, I'll pay you later. You know, buy now, pay later on credit. There's always the possibility that they may renege on their promise. You know, that's why you have, you know, uh, collection agencies because some people, they don't pay. They buy, but they don't pay. They don't fulfill their end of the transaction. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, in the Ashtara, God has already purchased the souls and the wealth of their believers. Allah, the, He's already bought it. Now, you as the seller, you may ask that, is there a possibility that God may renege on his promise because it happens in our interactions with human beings. You know, the buy now, pay later. Sometimes later never happens. But here Allah gives his assurance. Wa'dan ali That this is a promise that is binding upon him. And it's a promise that he is not only made in the Quran. It's a promise going back to even the time of Musa. That it's mentioned in the Torah. It's a promise that's mentioned in the Injil. It's mentioned again in the Quran. وَمَنْ أَوْفَى وَمَنْ أَوْفَى بِعَهِدِهِ مِنَ اللَّهِ And who is truer to his promise than God? فَاسْتَبْشِرُوا بِبَيْعِكُمُ الَّذِي بَايَعْتُمْ بِهِ So rejoice in the bargain you have made. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you that it's a bargain. Why is it a bargain? Because you're selling something to God that doesn't even belong to you. It belongs to Him. But because He's so generous and loving, He is pretending as though you own it. And He wants to buy it and He wants to give you something beyond your comprehension. That this is a bargain. Because the buyer actually owns what you're selling. But He's ignoring the fact that He owns it out of His mercy and out of His desire to give you eternal happiness and eternal reward. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us and guide us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahireen. We can take questions and answer, uh, qu uh, questions or comments for those of you who have them. So one thing that was interesting was that in the previous verse with one tenant says that they will not know peace until their hearts are rent asunder. Uh, so does that imply that like once that happens, they will feel at peace? Uh, what what does it mean for the heart to be rent asunder? So the commentators of the Quran, they uh, so you're referring to ayah number one ten. When Allah says, "Illa an taqatta'a qulubuhum," Wallahu alimun hakim. That uh, rent asunder means that they will remain in the state until uh, until death, until they die. Now that doesn't mean that they're going to be at peace after death. It just means that they will continue to experience this turmoil, this internal agitation, until the day that they die. Because you know the heart is rent asunder, it's it's an expression of uh, of uh, of great fear that when your heart you know, shatters into pieces because of fear, and that's what they will experience when they transition to uh, to alam al -akhir. So they will they will have this feeling of turmoil until the day that they die. Okay, so it's it's not referring to some sort of an epiphany or something like that. According to the the mufassirin that. Uh, means that until they are uh, until they die okay thank you um, and one question um what can be done for a mosque that receives little donations for growth and what it does have is used for the bills um and referring to uh, there's a history of mis mismanagement which has deterred people from donating so can you repeat the, I, I didn't hear the full question. What was the first part of the question? Uh, so this is an online question and it's uh, referring to um, what can be, what can be done for a masjid 
that receives only a few donations and that donations kind of get used up quickly for bills and stuff. And apparently the masjid has a history of mismanagement that deters people from donating to it. So, and, and this is a very, very common problem across many communities. You know, when a, when a masjid is not run by people who have the proper skill set, you know, this typically happens, that programs are not offered that have real value. You know, people contribute when they feel that they're receiving uh, valuable programs, programs that are addressing uh, their problems and offering solutions. So, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, resources are very limited, that, you know, there's a lot of financial strain on many of the centers is that the reality is that many of the centers are failing to meet the challenges of, of Muslims, you know, living uh, in, uh, in the West. Many of them are very disconnected that most of the masajid around the world, unfortunately, are only places where you go to maybe offer your prayers and maybe hear a lecture and probably not even in English. Or if it's in English, it's not, it's not delivered by someone who's proficient in English. And if it's delivered by someone who speaks in English, they're not speaking about relevant issues. Now, presumably, a mosque is going to have you know certain bylaws. They're going to have elections. They're, and I hope that's the case. You know, it 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 takes a lot of patience and determination, but it's possible to get involved in the activities of the masjid, become a member. You know, become a voting member and ultimately make your way to a uh, to a board position. Now, it's easy to uh, to point the finger and say that you know this this masjid is is not managed properly. So you 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 do something about it. You know, be involved and and you need to do it in a way that's non-combative. You know, sometimes when we see a masjid that's mismanaged, we automatically assume that all oh, you know they're just they're just not good people. They're evil. That might not be the case. It, it, it may be that no one is, is is rising to the occasion and you have people who have a very limited skill set and they're doing the best that they can and they're just not, they don't have the uh, the training to run a nonprofit organization. So if you feel that you have the training, that you have to become more involved. And yes, it's going to be annoying. People are going to say things that are, are going to rub you the wrong way. People are going to drive you crazy. But you know, when you do things for the sake of Allah, expect shaitan to make things difficult for you. That how, how much are you willing to endure for the sake of God? Or do we just throw in the towel because someone gave us a dirty look at the masjid? So it, it requires patience. It requires planning. It requires participation. So my, my humble recommendation is that if, if you feel that a masjid only has enough to pay their bills, their utility bills, and it's because the mosque is not is mismanaged. Perhaps reach out to the board members and, and volunteer to, to give them some help. You know, because I, I think many communities will be very receptive to uh, you know to, to some of that uh, that advice. And if that's not the case, slowly try to bring on change. You know, you, you have to surround yourself with like-minded people. You know, join, become members at the masjid, become voting members, and slowly, you know, demonstrate that you're that you're committed to the success of the community. Because remember that when the Prophet was in Mecca, before he was a Nabi, he was Amin. The Prophet, the reason why he was so effective is because he established credibility before he assumed the role of Prophet. You know, some of us. We want to be Nabi in our community before we're Amin. You have to show up. You have to have a track, a proven track record of commitment and hard work. And then your word is going to carry weight. But if you come out of nowhere and you say, oh, I want to be on the board. I want to do this. I want to do that. You're, you're failing to do what the Prophet did. You're trying to be Nabi before you were a Sadiq al-Amin. Where the reality is that you have to... As you have to establish your credentials that you have to uh, demonstrate that you're a person of, of good re uh, reputation in the community you have to you have to win their hearts 
through this uh, this track record of uh, of community service and community activism, and doing it for the sake of Allah, not for the sake of recognition. And when people see that, you, you're not going to be an easy person to discount. And even if you even if you are discounted the first time, you be like Nuh. You know, be have the determination of Nuh. Don't give up. He used to preach day and night to his community, and they used to stone him. Alhamdulillah, no, I don't think anyone's going to stone you if you go to the masjid and say that you want to, you know, join the board or you want to be more involved. You know, they might give you dirty looks. They might say things about you. But inshallah, mu'mineen have to have thick skin and they have to persevere and, uh, and always remember that the outcome doesn't matter. That as long as you work hard and you work for the sake of Allah, that Allah, inshallah, will bless your efforts. Thank you, Sheikh. And uh, in, in regards to judging based off of the apparent, to what extent can we use that to be wary of unscrupulous people that may want to take advantage of us? Should we always give them the benefit of the doubt? Now, everything has to be done you know, within, uh, within reason. You, know, you, you give people the benefit of the doubt when there is doubt. But if you have knowledge, if you are certain that someone is, you know, uh, you know, uh, cynical. That someone is uh, corrupt. Then you have to take the effective uh, uh, measures. But yeah, the, the, the believers should always give uh, benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, you're not required to let people into your personal life. I think you can maintain distance from people, treat them with respect, treat them with kindness. And and not judge them, but at the same time, you don't you know let them in. You know they don't you don't you don't bring them too close to yourself and to your family. So yeah, give people the benefit of the, of the doubt when when there is room for doubt. But if there's no room for doubt, and they've you know you have you know proof, and you're hundred percent convinced that this person is wicked, then keep your distance, and that's it. And, and you don't need to uh, you know mi minimize your contact with them, and just you know be just pleasant acquaintances and leave it at that now of course it's a if it's a relative then you, you know you can't cut ties you just maintain ties but you distance yourself from them for the sake of protecting your faith protecting your you know your maintaining your sanity but at the same time you don't sever ties you say salam to them you check up on them every once in a while and then you you fulfilled your your islamic obligation of maintaining ties with your with your nearest of kin Thank you. And uh, in verses, uh, verse number one hundred and eight, uh, is there a reason why uh, there's an emphasis placed on don't uh, on the when it says since the very first day? Were there people who wanted to maybe repurpose the masjid that was made by Abu Amr? We don't. We know we, we don't have any uh, any indication that 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 masjid was uh, you know there was there was a change because that masjid was destroyed quickly after it was built the uh the indication of uh of uh of the idea of taqwa min awwal yawm, that from the first day it, it's basically to highlight that the the intention behind the building of this masjid uh has to be uh has to be pure but it, but it's also it's also possible that you know a mosque is not built with with good intentions but then you have people that come and uh, who take over the masjid and you know redirect the culture of, of the masjid to be something that's pleasing to God. That that is uh, fine. But the, the meaning of min awwal yom is that you know a mosque that was established on the foundations of, of piety and you know seeking the pleasure of God is is something that is, is gonna have value as opposed to something that's done for other than the sake of God. Uh, thank you. And uh, there's one more question. This is a little off topic, but we have, if you have some time. Sure. Um, yeah. It's uh, regarding the creation of Hazrat Adam. Uh, was he created as a prophet or was he later turned into one? And if it was the latter, then when did that happen? So this is uh, a point of contention among the, uh, the ulama. Now, 
we know that Adam alayhi salam was uh, was not a prophet in, in the sense that we know it when he was in the uh, that earthly garden. So there's no need for Adam alayhi salam to be a prophet. Now, of course, you know he has his own spiritual rank before God, but prophethood is a duty. It's a job. And it, it, it wouldn't make sense for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to appoint Adam as a prophet from the inception of his creation, especially in that garden when there's no sharia. What, what, what are you, what are you going to propagate if there's, you know, because a prophet has a message to deliver, is, is propagating something. And in the garden where, when he was with Eve, there, there's no such thing as nubuwa because there's no taklif. He's not really there's no there's no religious teachings to abide by for Adam to be a prophet from from the, the inception of his creation. So when did he become a prophet? We don't know. Sometime on earth, you know, when he was trans when he was when he tra was transferred from that garden to this, you know, uh this realm of uh this earthly world of ibtila and trial, but we don't specifically know uh when his uh, his prophethood uh, commenced, and and as I said, this is a point of contention because Shia theologians all believe that prophets are mahsum from birth, but they don't. But scholars are not in agreement over you know the fact that all prophets are prophets from the moment that they're born. Some prophets begin are are appointed later on in their lives. So for you know Musa alayhi salam for example you know he was not a prophet in in the official sense when he was in the palace of uh, Firaun he was ma'sum but he was not a prophet he was only appointed later on if you take for example Harun Harun was appointed as a prophet by Musa's recommendation so you see, even, even Musa can't appoint another prophet. He has to invoke God, and Allah accepted that recommendation, and he appointed Harun as a prophet. But prior to that recommendation by Musa, Harun wasn't a prophet. He was ma'soom, but he wasn't a prophet. So prophets begin, so prophethood is, the position of prophethood is granted. It's, it's given to ma'soomin at different stages. You know, you take for example Isa. Isa's prophethood began on the day that he was born, because his circumstances dictated that there was a need for a miracle, and therefore his his ministry, his prophethood began uh, from day one. But others, Allah appointed them later on. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala determines when it's time for them to assume the role of being prophets and messengers. It can happen early on or it can happen later and Allah decides when it's when it's appropriate for them to assume that that official role but there is no disagreement over the fact among Shia theologians over infallibility all of them are ma'sumin are infallible from the day that they're born 